last few weeks, we've looked at different dysfunctions that we deal with in the holiday. We've looked at depression. We've looked at unforgiveness. We've looked at coveting. We've looked at obligation. We've looked at all of these through different stories in the scriptures. And just realize this, like, we all have dysfunction. We all have brokenness. We all are a work in progress. Like, here's just the good news. The good news is this, is that in the midst of your brokenness, in the midst of my brokenness, in the midst of my dysfunction, in the midst of your dysfunction, in the midst of all the reasons that God has to reject and turn his back on you, to judge me, the good news is this, that God is for you. He's for you. So in the lowest of lows that you may have in your life, God doesn't say, huh, not for you, for them. But no, he's for you. In the highest of highs, he's for you. He's not against you. He's for you within your life. And we know that because he came to us in Jesus. Like, this idea is not a hope. It's, it's, this is... You know, not like, man, if there is a God, I hope that there is, and whew, it'd be great if that God was for me and not against me. Gosh, I hope that's the case. That's not it. That's not it. No, the hope in is, is what we know to be true, that God came to us in the Sunday school answer, in Jesus. God came to us in Jesus. God in the flesh came to us in Jesus to rescue us, to redeem us, to set us free that we would not be conformed to the world, but we would be transformed, that he would literally renew our minds that we could step into the people that he's created us to be. That the longer that I allow God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to renew me and transform me, the more my life will look and point to Jesus. We know that to be true. That's what our hope is. The good news is that God is for you. God is for you. All right, so this recipe that's coming against us to be conformed to the world that often it's about us looking like the world. And so just one of the things that can get in the way here is letting the world shape your holiday. And the way that you do that is living reactively. So I, I, have, a little, I have a number of problems. Um, one of them are Instagram ads right now. Like, I've been buying so much stuff. They know me. They track me. Like, why is it? I don't know about you guys. Do you ever, like, I'm going through Instagram. I'm like, oh, that looks amazing. Shop now. I'm like, okay, I'll get that. And I'm like, Amanda's like, what's this? Oh, I just saw, I look great. Like, I have this ruler thing that you're supposed to build. It's so ridiculous, right? So, and part of it for me is I'm just, it's kind of funny, but not. It is a little bit of a problem. I'm working on it. Um, it's living reactively. Like, how often in our lives do we just react in this season? So we talked a little bit about last week about, do you know, like, what your budget is for Christmas? Do you know where you're going to spend your time? Or is it just like somebody calls you and says, hey, will you, oh, yeah, I'll just do that, living reactively. Or we drink the culture's Kool-Aid. We drink the culture's Kool-Aid. In the 1900s, Sears and Roebuck decided that they would send out catalogs around Thanksgiving. Changed everything, right? I mean, like, like you, I remember being as a kid, like getting, getting that catalog, and my brother, we would fight over it. 
like tearing it apart to try to figure out which toys we wanted to get on Christmas. And, you know, I, I'm not saying that, like, your children shouldn't want to get things on Christmas. What I am saying is Christmas is not about drinking the Kool-Aid of it's all about what we can consume and the more we consume, the better our Christmas is. That's not the point. I think what's happened is Christmas has shifted from a time to remember and celebrate that God is for me to a time for me to consume more things. Christmas has shifted from a time to remember and celebrate that God is for me to a time to consume more things. Like, I would just say at the end of the day, when you get to January 1 in the next month, I'd love for, like, a a learning moment to be, you know what? I believe that God is for me more now today than I did a month ago. Versus, we had a bigger Christmas than we had last year. Bigger is not always what? Better, okay? Um, I, I think there's a recipe for transformation, though. And I want to just point us to Romans chapter 12 today. Um, I love this. This is such a great chapter. It's worth just sitting with a little bit in your life. Um, as you're going there, either on your phone or if you have your Bible with you, Romans comes right after the book of Acts. And um, the next several books are actually letters that this guy Paul wrote. And Romans is the last letter that he wrote before he was executed, even though it's the first one in the Bible. It's the first one because it's the longest So the way they ordered it is they put Paul's longest letter all the way to his shortest. But you get a real mature Paul um, here in Romans. Um, So we're going to read verses 1 through um, 1 and 2 and then 9 through 13 here in chapter 12, okay? Listen to this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable And perfect. Then verse 9. Let your love be genuine. Arbor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. I love that, right? Like, how often do we compete against one another to try to lift ourselves up over someone else? Where Paul says, competition's good. Why don't, why don't you compete, though, in who's showing each other the most honor? Like, that's different. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. And here's a good one. Be patient in tribulation. I mean, when it's stressful, when there's pressure, when it seems like things are not getting better, but actually getting worse, Wow, do I get impatient. Do you ever find yourself doing that? Like, I just, like, 
I need to fix this quick. And I start reacting. Start getting conformed. Start acting out of my flesh. And what happens? It gets even worse. Paul says that, like, be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. And seek to show hospitality. So don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Present yourself like this is your spiritual act of worship. Guys, you and I, our job over these next four weeks, as we prepare to celebrate that God is not against us, but he's what? He's for us, not because we're hoping he's going to come, but because he has come in Jesus, who lived and then died our death to defeat death, to pour out forgiveness, that we could have new life, be set free to step into everything he wants us to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. Like, it sounds like a good gig. Like, I mean, that's, that doesn't sound like a bad deal. That sounds like a good deal. And our job, my job, your job now is to say, Lord, in response to that, I, I want to present myself as a living sacrifice to you. I do not want to be conformed to the recipe of the world, but I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And here's the recipe. I hold fast to what is good. I hold fast to what is good. Like, you know what's good. I know what's good. You know if you're doing something that is not good. I mean, you, like we know it. Like we, I know if I'm bending the rules a little bit. I know if I'm putting on this face, but underneath there's something else driving it. Like you know when you're doing that. I know when I'm doing that. Like Paul says, like, look. Do what's good. Be authentic. Be real. Be who you are. And love one another. Love one another. Rejoice in hope. Be constant in prayer. Give to needs around you. Show hospitality. I think Paul's saying this. It's very simple. Don't live reacting to what's going on around you. Actually, live proactively. Live proactively. Do these things. And the byproduct of that will be your mind and heart will be transformed. You'll experience renewal in your life. That's the byproduct of that. So I want to give you a recipe, I think, that will help you do that um, over the next several weeks. I want to invite you just to walk in it, to allow the Holy Spirit to fill your life, that you have a transforming Christmas season and as we look towards the next month to prepare for Jesus' coming, the celebration of that, that your life and my life will point to who's the king of my life. So there's room for one throne on your life, just one. There's room for one, one seat. It's not a dual seat, right? It's not like, you know, it's not a boardroom table where you have a president and a vice president and a treasurer. It's not, you know, there's not a Congress that meets and votes or any of that. Like, there's one seat on the throne of your life and my life. And I, I just love for your Christmas season this year that your life would point to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who's on the throne of your life. Like, here's just, I think it's a proactive recipe, okay? I'd love for you just to have a prayer of thanksgiving each day. And I'd like you to think of it in this way. Like categorize it. Some of you won't like to categorize it because it's too much planning. Some of you will just want to kind of do it on a whim. That will be fine. You have permission to do that. For you that like to have a plan together, I would think this, okay. Like on Monday, what am I going to be thankful for? Well, I'll be thankful for my wife on Monday. I sh I'll be thankful for her every day, you guys, but Monday will be a special day of thankfulness, okay? And, you know, it's like say a prayer, like, gosh, I'm so thankful, Lord, for, you know, Amanda. She's awesome, and I love her. And God might say, well, 
you should get her an extra gift. And I'll say, Lord, that feels like obligation and not generosity. No, I'm kidding. Uh, (laughs) But I mean, the Lord might speak something to you of something you need to do that day for that person. Maybe, you know, Tuesday is like, hey, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to think about my kids. I'm going to be thankful for my kids on Tuesday. If you have little ones whose minds are being sucked dry by the world conforming them that they should get all of this stuff, that Christmas is about that, um, you might need two days to be thankful for them. You know? Heck, Wednesday might be me. You just might be thankful for me on Wednesday. I don't know. I, w- I, would, I would think about it. In your life, like, where, 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 does your, where do you need to be thankful? And just, like, every Monday for the next four Mondays, what if you just spent some time there? And Tuesday and Wednesday. Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday. Short, brief, five minutes, whatever. And if in the midst of that, God says, do this, go do it. Go do it. Like, you'd be amazed today. Like, oh, he's, God is so annoying sometimes. Like, does he wreck your life? Like, this morning, I, he just brought me to Matthew 25. And that's the story of the sheep and the goats. And it's like, how will they, how will you know you've cared for the least of these? Whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done unto me. Like, when did we see you and feed you and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the Lord's like, um, yeah, you know, visit the sick and, you know, you feed the hungry. I'm like, check, check. He's like, um, visit the prisoner. Chad, when's the last time you've been to the prison? I'm like. I'm like, Lord, I'm doing two out of three. Is it multiple choice? Do I just get to pick one? You know, like, ah. So, guess what I got to do now? <laughs> yeah. I mean, but it's a, it, like, he's going to say something. He'll say, and you just got to do it. You just got to do it. He might tell you to come with me to the prison. I don't know now. I mean, who knows? All right? Just pray for Thanksgiving each day. I'd love to like, I'd love you to, to go for three acts of kindness a week. And then just three a week. I, I'd, I'd love you to say, Lord, if there's a place you want me to be kind, show me. Now, it could be as simple as letting somebody have a parking spot. Because they're going to be far and few between for all the guys on the 24th when we're all out there. I mean, it, it might be getting somebody's cup of coffee. It might be buying lunch. It might, I mean, it might be leaving like a nice tip. It, it might be, you know, making some bread and taking them to the neighbor. Like, I, have, I don't know. Honestly, I don't really care. I just think it'd be great if we all said, look, I want to commit to God. If you, if you inspire me with an act of kindness, I'm going to have the, enough courage to actually go for it. I'm not going to be conformed by the world and think I shouldn't do it. I'm actually going to allow you to transform me by the renewal of my mind, and I'm going to show an act of kindness. I think that'd be great. Um, if you have kids, I'm like a huge fan of this. Like help them make a giving list. Help them make a giving list. I, I just got to... I feel like a parent fail. You know, I've got seven-year-old, 10-year-old, 13-year-old, 21-year-old, okay? This is my range. I feel like a dad fail for me is for a long time, um, I've allowed this whole idea of getting stuff because I love to give stuff to my kids. Like, I, I love this season. Like, I love the buy things for people that I love and, and generous. And Amanda's like, bro, you need a budget because you're, you just you need one. It's just so fun. I just I enjoy it. I want them just to enjoy it. But in the midst of that, I haven't, like, I haven't helped disciple them in that same joy, in that same joy. And Christmas is about generosity. And you obviously hear this in a church at some point in time every year. But it's good. We should hear it. It is true. Uh, a giving list. So 
last night, uh, the girls were online, and they were just looking at all the stuff they want to get their friends. Like, super excited about little gifts for their friends. And honestly, more excited than they are about stuff they talk about they want to get. Because there's something in us that wants to give more than receive. Something in us that drives us that way. Today on the way to church, they're like, oh my gosh, tomorrow's Cyber Monday. I've got these footies and Old Navy I want to get for my friend. I'm getting this person this footie. And I'm like, that's awesome. Like, have them do a giving list. A giving list. Um, next week, Advent is the church word for preparation. Next week, we begin this preparation for the coming of Jesus. We're going to give you a guide. There's going to be something where you can spend each night with your family, just helping to center yourself in the midst of the season. Would love for you to um, think through that. And the last one is just commit to generosity, meaning from last week, not obligation. Generosity in that you can only say yes in particular places. You can't say yes everywhere. So I just love for you to proactively think, where's my yes when it comes to time and money in this Christmas season? Like, where do I want to be generous with my time and with my money so you can say no everywhere else and not feel bad about it, okay? I, I think that I'm sure there are plenty of other ingredients that you can put up there. But if I think if you'll... If you and I will just say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to str- go for that, I think it will proactively set you up to allow the Holy Spirit to transform and renew you in such a way that you'll get to the end of it, end of January, and you'll say, you know what, gosh, I know God is for me, and you know what, I was for the people around me this season. I was a blessing this season. Like, people were better because I was invested in the way, into this season, the way that I should be. And let me just close with this this morning. I don't just think this is a cute idea. You know, I don't just think it's good information. Like, at the end of the day, I think this is about our legacy. Like, I think this is about your legacy. I think this is about what you leave behind you. This is a season that is different than any other season of the year. Right? Like, I mean, I don't know of any other, any other four weeks of the year that's like the four weeks coming up in front of us. This is the season where many of the memories that shape how you think life is happen during these four weeks, that this is about your legacy. This is about what you leave behind you. This is about how you and I shape those who come after us. And the question I just put in front of you and me this morning, just as we close, is will your legacy, will my legacy be a legacy of conforming to the world Or will it be a legacy of being transformed by Christ the King? So am I leaving a legacy that's being conformed to the world, or am I leaving a legacy that's being transformed by Christ the King? I think that having a life being transformed by Christ the King is a much better legacy than a life that's conforming to the world. And I don't think there's a ton of options. I think it really is that simple. And my hope, my heart for you, for me, is that by God's grace, by the truth of knowing that he's for us, that we can have a legacy where we are being transformed by Christ the King.